Please uh, join me, stand if you're willing and able. We're going to start the service with Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5. go juice this morning, so pardon my tardiness. You guys sound serious. <laughs> well, good morning to everyone and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane where we join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and live justly. As always, I want to begin by welcoming all of you to this space, all of your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, your differences, all that helps make you who you are is welcome here this morning, and this includes those in the room with us, as well as the many of you who are live streaming with us today. Great to have all of you wherever you are. I have just uh, one announcement. Uh, our NAUA, North American Unitarian Association, yearly summit, the first yearly summit, is happening at our church in October, October uh, the weekend of October 18th through the 20th, uh, there's, it'll, be, it'll be both in person and remote. So folks who are joining us from around the countries uh, or even locals who can't make it in and want to be part of it, you can please go online and register. There's a couple, there's a registration fee, a different cost for in person to help cover some of the food costs and that sort of stuff, keynote speaker. Uh, and, and a, a much uh, lighter expense for folks who are going to be Zooming with us, but we, we hope we'll have a good turnout and we'd love to have more people registering. So if you'll go on naunitarians.org and register. Uh, Gordon was asking, by the way, Gordon, thank you for uh, filling in as our song leader and, and special music today. Appreciate it. But if I knew the times, and so I actually don't don't have that myself. What I What I know is that uh, Friday will be sort of registration and informal gatherings and getting to know each other here in, here in person. Uh, and then Saturday will be most of the programming, right? So we'll, we'll have uh, a few uh, different workshops throughout the day. Our keynote speaker will actually, who is Stephen, Hassan, ha Stephen Hassan, the, uh, the mind control expert, uh, will be giving our keynote address at 10 a.m. And then we'll have other activities throughout the day. And then Sunday we'll conclude with a common service here on Sunday uh, in the sanctuary. So that gives you at least a little bit of a rundown of what's what's going to be going on. But yeah, I would, would uh, ask you to go to the website and register if you can. That would be great. I'll probably bug you again next week and from now on until October. Okay, yeah, let's, let's take a few minutes to say hi to one another. This is a sparse crowd this, 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 today, so you take a little bit of a walk, get some extra steps in.
All right. Let's move forward now with the lighting of our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. The opening words this morning are from Susie Kassam from her book, Rise Up and Salute the Sun. I have been finding treasures in places I did not want to search. I have been hearing wisdom from tongues I did not want to listen to. I have been finding beauty where I did not want to look. And I have learned so much from the journeys that I did not want to take. Forgive me, for I have been closing my ears and eyes for too long. I have learned that miracles are only called miracles because they are often witnessed by those who can see through all of life's illusions. I am ready to see what really exists on the other side, what exists behind the blinds, and taste all the ugly fruit instead of all that looks right, plump, and ripe. Please stand as you're willing and able to join us in the spirit of life, hymn 123, and we're going to sing it through twice. now kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning and begin as we have been for too long now with a candle on behalf of the people of Ukraine and that region of the world being impacted by the war and violence there as well as a candle for the people of Israel and Palestinian people who are suffering from the horrific violence going on in that part of the world. I do want to kindle a candle of celebration for Kelsey Gray and Joe King, who are celebrating their anniversary. There they are. Right there, celebrating your anniversary today. <laughs> Happy anniversary. We won't ask you how long or anything like that, but uh, congratulations. So let's do share a moment of silence on by behalf of others that you might be thinking of, and as always, you're welcome to name them aloud if you'd like.
those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. And we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world. Thank you, Maura. Time for our story for all ages. So anybody who wants to move closer for this of any age is welcome to do so. While I uh, bring forward a special friend who's here to help. There you go. Thank you, guys. I don't want my friend to feel like he's the only kid here, you know. So this is, this is a kid. Some of you may recognize, he's been here a few, few times before. This is my friend, Eddie. Eddie, would you like to say hello to everybody? Good day. Now, Eddie, won't, won't you, won't you uh, please give everybody a good welcome? No. Okay. So uh, I, I, for those who don't know, Ed, Eddie is very obstinate. His nickname's Obstinate Eddie, and he tends to, to do the opposite of everything people ask, correct? Wrong. Okay. Well, uh, let, let's, let's show him what I mean. Uh, I'll show you what I mean here. Would you, would you please look to your right? Okay, that's your left. Would you please look to your left? All right, that's your right. Okay, go ahead and look up for me. Eddie, look down. All right, open your mouth. Close your eyes. Okay, so, so you can see what I mean. But anyway, I'm very glad you're here. This is actually the perfect day for you to be here. Are you glad you're here? Not at all. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. Have you been enjoying uh, in your summer so far? Not in the least. Oh, that's wonderful news. Are you glad you're here today? I'm ready to go home. Oh, I'm glad you're planning on staying. So anyway, the reason I think it's great that you're here is because you remind me of somebody. Year years ago, when I was studying ministry, working, uh, getting my clinical pastoral education in a hospital setting, I uh, was told by one of my instructors, he said, Todd, you are a Hayoka. And I said, what is a Hayoka? He's a Native American instructor. And he said, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a person who lives their life backwards, does the opposite of what's expected. So we're kind of alike in that respect, Eddie. No, we're not. Thank you. I'm glad you agree with me. So I, I went and uh, I asked him to send me something about the Hayoka, and I, and I learned about it. It's a Lakota, uh, based on a Lakota story in which a young warrior, Aya, has to go meet the terrible and frightening Thunderbird to ask for help for his people who are suffering from starvation and sickness. And uh, Nobody has ever survived encountering the Thunderbird before because it's a very terrifying creature. It uh, lives in a, in a counterclockwise dimension in which everything is the opposite of what goes on in our world. Doesn't that sound like something you'd like? No. I didn't think so. But anyway, 
The Thunderbird, uh, nobody's ever survived an encounter with it. It has this frightening body that constantly billows back and forth like clouds. It has claws, but no feet. It has wings, but no shoulders. A loud thundering voice, but no throat. And it shoots deadly thunderbolts from its eyes and has been known to swallow entire whales and ships in one gulp. What do you think is that? Does that, does that scare you? No. Oh, I didn't think so. Anyway, uh, when Aya finally stands before the terrible Thunderbird, instead of cowering in fear, he does the opposite, just like you might do. He begins laughing and standing on his head and walking with his hands, and he says, You pitiful thing, your small voice frightens no one. Your weak eyes can hurt nothing. Your beak and your teeth are useless. Your wings look like taggered rags. Your talons are like flimsy blades of grass. I'm embarrassed to be in your company. I am not afraid of you in the least. You know what happens next? Yes. Okay, then I'll tell you. Instead of being angry, Thunderbird was the opposite. Thunderbird said, Your words have greatly pleased me, for I prefer always to be addressed in terms opposite the intentions of those before me. And the strange creature then invites Aya to place his teepee next to his own lodge on Thunder Mountain and promises together that they will work to turn the world around and make it better for everyone. And from that point on, Aya was a Hayoka and began talking backwards and walking backwards and dressing backwards and even started growing younger. Now, do you know what the moral of this story is? Yes. Then I'll tell you. If you want to turn the world around, sometimes we have to start by turning ourselves around and doing the opposite. How did you like that? I hated it. I'm so happy. Now, would you please tell everybody your welcome and hello? Thank you and good day. All right. Now stand up straight. Oh, thank you, Eddie. <laughs>meditation words from Barack Obama. We are reminded that in the fleeting time we have on this earth, what matters is not wealth or status or power or fame, but rather how well we have loved and what small part we have play, played in making the lives of other people better.
and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up so I can walk on seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come and I am filled with wonder, sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be you raise me up to more than I can be Thank you so much, Gordon. Maura, beautiful. Yeah. Well, for the past two years now, a pair of robins have built their nest beneath the awning of our front porch, each of which ended up containing four bright blue eggs. All four of last, year, last year's eggs hatched, and I was able to observe their daily progress of healthy, the, the healthy hatchlings until one morning there were only two. And this wasn't because they had matured well enough to fly away, but because a robin's nest is ultimately only large enough for two healthy hatchlings. Two of them were destined to be squeezed out from the start. In this year's nest, one of the eggs was stolen by crows, even as the hatchling was breaking through. One failed to hatch altogether, maybe because it had been damaged by the crow attack, leaving two healthy chicks to hatch and fill that tight space. And as those two grew and were getting close to leaving, one of them fell to its death. I put a rubber mat down to spare the only surviving fledgling from succumbing to the same fate. That's only three out of eight that live long enough to have a chance at life. This is but one example of the harsh reality of life. Nature must be extremely inefficient in order to guarantee that some life can continue. It wastes life and a lot of potential life to make life. Not only has sexual reproduction evolved to produce millions of times more gametes, such as sperm and eggs and seed and fruit and pollen and spores, than will ever be used to reproduce. But as in the case of these robins, the majority of the lives that are produced don't survive long enough to mature. Most creatures born on earth don't survive long enough to mature. The result is that there are far more robins born than there are mature robins, far more fruit than there are fruit trees, far more pollen than flowers, far more fertilized fish eggs than fish, 
and so on. Throughout most of human history, until it began to change only in the 19th century, it's estimated that nearly half of all human children died before the age of five. According to the World Health Organization, things have improved a lot since then, especially since 1990, when there were only 12.5 million under five deaths, which is just 3.7% of the births, compared to half. In 2022, there were only 4.9 million such deaths, almost half of whom were newborns, and 80% of whom were from Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, which tells us that economic imbalances in the world still have a lot to do with child mortality rates, even in our modern world. And if our, if our own solar system is any indicator, given the sparsity of life we found in it so far, the entire universe, which is incomprehensibly large, is just as inefficient. Consider all the time and space there is compared to what must be an infinitesimally small amount of life. Life that took billions of years to come in, into existence only to result in our minuscule lifespans. I bring all of this up because in order to discuss the nature of evil, the name that we often give to all of our suffering and loss, we must begin by admitting that evil is a human concoction, that neither nature nor the universe are inherently evil or good. They just are. Nature and the universe don't care how many of us die, which so far is all of us, so long as just a few of us survive long enough to pass along the information that's encoded within us. That's the cold reality. That's how evolution happens, not the result of angry gods who require appeasement because of something we did wrong. But evil can be considered relatively real. It can be considered relatively real to us because that's how we experience the suffering and, the, and death. And we try to do our best as human societies to alleviate as much of it as we can. Those among us who intentionally cause others to suffer and die or who simply prevent them from achieving their full potential and living a happy life are rightly, from our human perspective, called evil or at least engaged in evil acts and evil systems. As human beings, we do care, unlike the universe, apparently. We do care, and we are saddened by the deaths of our loved ones, moved by the grief of those who have lost theirs, and consider the loss of any child a tragedy to us all, as we should. The other thing to remember about morality in general is that it is a perennial philosophical problem. One may feel certain about one's beliefs about what are good and evil is correct, but one's level of certainty proves absolutely nothing. No matter how sure one feels, proves absolutely nothing. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is certain that he knows what good and evil are and therefore feels entirely justified in killing as many innocent people as necessary to achieve his moral ends. The United States and the Soviet Union, along with a few other nations, were certain that amassing a global arsenal of over 80,000 nuclear warheads during the Cold War, enough to destroy the planet multiple times over, was the right thing to do. Our understanding of what is good and what is evil usually co happens to coincide with our own interests as individuals and societies. What a coincidence, I happen to be right. I happen to be on the right side. 
The result, according to social psychologist Eric Fromm, is the acceptance of a relativistic position which proposes that value judgments and ethical norms are exclusively matters of taste or arbitrary preference and that no objectively valid statement can be made in this realm. No objectively valid statement to be made about morality, about right and wrong. But must we leave it at this, he asks. Are we to accept the abdication of reason on matters of ethics? Are we to believe that the choices between freedom and slavery, between love and hate, between truth and falsehood, between hostility and optimism, between life and death, are only the results of so many subjective preferences? Fromm offers us another choice. To base our understanding of morality upon our human condition, psychology, and needs. Regardless of what is true of the larger universe, regardless of the epistemological problem of holding any truth with absolute certainty, we can simply choose to live in a way that promotes human welfare and individual unfolding so that both humanity and each individual can achieve its full potential. He refers to this choice, as you've often heard me refer to myself, as the humanistic ethic, explaining that formally it is based on the principle that only humanity can determine the criterion for virtue and sin, and not an authority transcending mankind. Materially, it is based on the principle that good is what is good for humanity and evil what is detrimental to humanity the sole criterion of ethical value being human welfare. Right? We, 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 we can't know ultimate truth, but we can know what it's like to live as human beings. And we can base our ethics on that experience. And this includes recognizing our relatedness to others and to the world, including to the environment and other creatures, it also includes recognizing our common humanity, which is why the humanistic ethic has, since the French Revolution at least, been summarized as the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Fromm says that all men are in need of help and depend upon one another. Human solidarity is the necessary condition for the unfolding of any one individual. Supporting each other is how we unfold. To be humanely ethical means that we then must truly love one another, as the ancients have said. But love isn't an emotion. It's a way of behaving towards others, whether we like them or not. Humanistic love, which is the basis of the humanistic ethic, is universal and thus recognizes our common humanity connecting us to all people everywhere. The most fundamental kind of love, Fromm says, which underlies all types of love, is brotherly love. By this I mean the sense of responsibility, care, respect, knowledge of any other human being, and the wish to further that person's life. That's what love is. Wanting to further that person's life, and that's what the love of humanity is to further human progress and further the life of, of every human individual. Fromm says, this is the kind of love the Bible speaks of when it says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Brotherly love is love for all human beings. It is characterized by, by its very lack of exclusiveness. Yet throughout human history, our societies have often been built around grave inequalities in which a few have had all the power, wealth, and rights at the expense of almost everyone else. Kings and commoners, nobles and serfs, patricians and plebeians, pharaohs and peasants, commanders and 
infantries and so forth. This hierarchical ethic, which may work for the benefit of the larger society, sometimes by providing at least a sense of stability and security, isn't humanistic because it is not enough to maintain the greater good at the expense of the individual's need to flourish. The humanistic, humanistic ethic, by contrast, recognizes that the individual cannot thrive if he or she is not free to choose for oneself. Free to be oneself. It is an ethic recognized in the universal golden rule that calls upon us to treat others the way that we would like to be treated which is predicated, again, upon the belief in our common humanity. Why would we care about how we treat others unless we believe and accept that they are human beings endowed with the same type of dignity that we want for ourselves? And it is not limited, then, to a common religion or a common king or a common nation or a common ethnicity or a common political party or a common identity or any other closed circle that feels justified in discriminating against or abusing those outside. The humanistic ethic encompasses, encompasses the whole hoop of the world and every human society and individual upon it. The humanistic ethic is reflected in the Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, never treat others as a means to your own ends but as an end within themselves. And was revamped during the French Revolution, as I already stated, as the inherent worth and dignity of every person, an articulation of a principle that has been embedded in the constitutions of many democracies and until recently was the Unitarian Universalist Association's first principle. Sad to see that go. But it's still my principle my first principle. But ultimately, I actually prefer Fromm's mid-20th century definition of the humanistic ethic, stating that it is the principle that good is what is good for humanity and evil is what is detrimental to humanity, the sole criterion of ethical value being human welfare, and that the unfolding and growth of every person should be the aim of all social and political activities. That's how we know the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. Are we working for human welfare and individual well-being? And I also prefer Fromm's definition because it parallels what we know about what hum humans need to thrive, at least according to Abraham Maslow's well-known hierarchy of human needs which also addresses general human welfare, which is at, at the bottom of the pyramid, bottom half of the pyramid, clean air, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep, health, employment, security, and the like, and what is necessary for individual unfolding at the top of that pyramid, friendship, society, family, belonging, self-esteem, respect, and all that it takes for an individual to self-actualize, to achieve, to reach their full potential. Societies that concentrate only on one half of the pyramid of needs, providing basic needs at the cost of one's freedoms or guaranteeing one's freedoms at the expense of the masses, are not living according to the humanistic ethic and contribute to the degradation and to the suffering of both society and the individual. individual. Right, so if you have as in communism, which, uh, bases, which focuses on the lower half, giving everybody what they, what they need materially to survive, but does so by suppressing their ability to speak and think for themselves and be free, It is a failed society. If you have an extremely capitalistic society that guarantees the freedoms of the individual to gain as much as they can for themselves, even at the expense of the larger number of citizens, then 
it is a failed society. Economies that only work for a few are failed economies. Economies built on the suppression of individual freedom and other indignities is a fail, have failed economies. And from all of this, we can conclude that what, if what is good for human welfare and individual, if, 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 I'm sorry, from all of that, we can conclude that if what is good is what is good for human welfare and individual unfolding, then what is evil from a humanistic perspective must be considered whatever is detrimental to these dual goals, including any systems disregarding our common humanity in order to favor one group of people at the expense of another group of people. Recognizing this, we are now in a position to consider the evils that are currently happening in our world, and we have solid reason for making such claims. Evil is that which rejects our common humanity, disregards the inherent worth and dignity of every person and all peoples, no matter where they're from, what they look like, or what they believe, and otherwise undermines human welfare and individual freedom and growth. But before discussing real and present examples of pure evil, I'd like to point out that, at least in my opinion, the humanistic view of ethics implies that only humans can com commit acts of evil, whether collectively or as individuals. Well, there are certain natural calamities like hurricanes and droughts and diseases that cause humans to suffer. Nature does not do so with the intention of causing us to suffer. Wild animals can also be dangerous and deadly to humans, but their behaviors are without malice, like lions and sharks and grizzly bears and even pesky mosquitoes. Among other predators, only do what they have evolved to do to survive. Evil, rather, is a human concept and is caused by humans who willfully and knowingly ignore the negative impacts of their actions upon the welfare of others. Now, as I've already mentioned, for example, the evil that is currently happening in the Middle East, war in general is an evil because it is clearly, clearly detrimental to human welfare and individual flourishing and is rooted in the failure of at least one side of seeing the humanity, the worth, and the dignity in the other. Sadly, sometimes war is necessary in order to defend people against transgressors, like Russia's current invasion of Ukraine. But doing so in a manner that indiscriminately blames or kills masses of innocent civilians in the process or destroys their homes and their hospitals and their schools and their infrastructure is, according to the humanistic ethic, pure evil. The 18th century French Revolution began as a just effort to increase human welfare and individual freedoms by addressing social inequalities and abolishing the monarchy. And like all such revolutions, it was necessarily violent. But in 1973, four years after it began, 1793, four years after it began, the revolutionaries became perpetrators of such evil themselves by executing thousands of people during a year of savagery known infamously as the Reign of Terror. That's pure evil. Global warming is also an evil. One of the worst ever because it's one of the planet's greatest existential threats to human welfare and to the world in the entire four and a half billion year history of the planet. Unlike naturally occurring disasters, global warming is an evil because it has caused, it's been caused by unmitigated human activity. Scientists have known about the greenhouse gas effect since the turn of the 20th century, which has increasingly been taken seriously by the public since the 1960s. So much so that in 1970, Republican President Richard Nixon formed the Environmental Protection Agency. We had to get on this. 
Only a few years later, when he was elected in 1976, Democratic President Jimmy Carter created the Energy Department, lowered the national speed limit from 65 to 55, rolled out green tax credits and installed 32 solar panels on the White House roof as a symbolic gesture. As one of the worst polluters of carbon emitting nations in the world, we were on our way to becoming the global leader in addressing climate change before things worsened to the point that they have gotten to today. But after Ronald Reagan took office in 1980, he removed those solar panels, raised the speed limit to as high as 75 miles per hour in some places, and his anti-government, anti-regulation philosophy made neglecting the environment fundamental to the conservative cause. Reagan created con a conservative party that's against conservation. And ever since it has lied and denied and blocked any meaningful response to this unfolding existential threat. At first, they simply confused many American voters by falsely claiming global warming is a hoax and that there is much disagreement among scientists about it. They also made us think that any effort to protect the environment would cost jobs. We had a polarized choice to make. When George H. Bush was running against Bill Clinton in 1992, for example, he mocked Clinton's VP pick, Al Gore, as ozone man, further saying, this guy is so far out in the environmental extreme, we'll be up to our necks and owls and out of work for every American. A binary choice. We protect the environment or we're out of work. Later, when his son George W. was running against Gore, the younger Bush joked that his opponent likes electric cars, he just doesn't like making electricity. Bush ended up winning that election, as you know, by a vote of five to four. And when the partisan Supreme Court decided it would be unconstitutional to allow Florida to recount its votes, which would have most certainly proven that Gore had won the election. In order to unfold as individuals, humans need to be free, and that means having our voices heard and our votes counted. So the Supreme Court's decision is another evil of our modern times. The same Supreme Court that recently decided that a woman's right to choose ought to be left up to the states, including the state of Florida that doesn't have the right to recount its votes in a questionable election. That's pure evil. But let's get back to global warming. During the brief four years between Bush's Scottish appointment to the White House and his run for a second term, the impacts of global warming became too fierce to deny in that short period. So the GOP strategy was suddenly shifted their arguments went from it's a hoax and scientists greatly disagree about whether or not it's happening to it's a natural cyclic occurrence and scientists greatly disagree about what's causing it. Just subtly change the language. Yet even now, as each year for the past decade or longer has been hotter, the hottest on record, the grand old party continues to block any meaningful response to this perilous problem, including intentionally pulling out of any plan to work on it as a global community, as we've done with the Paris Climate Agreement. Or was done, I should say. Instead, all we hear from them is border. Border, border, border. As if it is the greatest and only problem the U.S. faces. Yes, between 100,000... I agree, man. Thank you for that. In the UU church, we don't ask for amens. We ask for... Bah. <laughs> oh, 
All right. So between 100,000 and 200,000, I think 250,000 at its peak, uh, of border encounters, now it doesn't mean crossings, but encounters at the border with immigrants per month is serious, especially for those communities impacted by that influx of population, right? People in need. Has to be dealt with. But doing so by separating children from their families, locking them in cages on a hard floor, and not keeping adequate records of whom they belong to, that's pure evil. So is claiming that you want to do something about the issue and blaming your political opponent, opponents for doing nothing even after you block meaningful bipartisan legislation to address it just so your opponents can't get any of the credit in an election year. That's pure evil. But I'm not through with global warming yet. Last summer, like my entire neighborhood, I was evacuated from my home because of a fire. Leave everything. Go. Today, the homes in my neighborhood are at risk of losing fire insurance because of that, because of that incident. And just last week, there was another fire threatening my neighborhood again, as well as the location of our church. Even so, I recall Mitt Romney, a Mitt Romney interview recently in which he spoke about the move to oust speaker, the Speaker of the House calling it a distraction and saying, we have important issues to address, like the border. Period. Nothing else on the list of issues. Likewise, during a February 27th press conference, House Speaker Mike Johnson himself said, the first priority of the country is our border and making sure it's secure. It's a catastrophe and it must stop. A month later, on April 16th, he told reporters, the Biden border catastrophe remains the number one priority of the House Republicans. And in response to the failed attempt to oust him from his position, I heard Johnson say that we have important issues to deal with, like the border and uh, uh, sound government. Took him a while to have something else on the list, although I don't know what he meant by sound government. I have an idea. How about global warming? which has led to catastrophe upon catastrophe, if you want to use that word. If you want to legitimately use it. If you're worried about immigrants crossing the southern border, how about the wildfire smoke crossing the northern border? How about the category four and five hurricanes crossing the eastern border? How about the category four tornadoes already well with inside all of our borders? wrecking deadly havoc, especially in the American heartland in the southern states. These are real catastrophes that must stop. To ignore them and to distract our attention from them with a single political wedge issue, falsely claiming we're being invaded by millions and millions of murderers and terrorists. I always want to put an accordion in his hands, you know. <laughs> By millions and millions of murders, murderers and terrorists, while continuing to ignore the deadly and devastating impacts of climate change, and while we're at it, how about gun violence by our fellow Americans that's already happening within our borders, truly impacting the lives of millions and millions of people, is pure evil. From a human perspective, it's pure evil. 
because it harms human welfare and prevents individuals from becoming their best. We have so many challenges before us. Additionally, like affordable health care, adequately funding public education, the rising cost of housing and homelessness, political gridlock, and so many other issues preventing humanity from progressing. We have to stop focusing on what's good for ourselves, our party, our nation, and start asking what will best promote human well-being and individual freedom and fulfillment. Anything less than that is pure evil. Thank you. Please stand and join us as we close with Blue Boat Home 1064 in the turquoise hymnal. benediction words from Martin Luther King Jr. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final wo word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil, triumphant. Amen, blessed be, salam alaikum, and shalom. Amen.